Thank you. Please be seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Ecclesiastes. And I'd ask you to turn there, Ecclesiastes in chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, and follow along, if you would, please, with your eyes as I read through this entire chapter. I said in mine heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doth it? I sought mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what is that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works, I builded me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them all of kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water, to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens and servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of sort and that of all sorts. So I was great, and increased more than all that was before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatsoever mine eyes desired I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, And this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all of the works that my hands had wrought, and on the laborer that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly, for what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which he hath been already done. Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly, as far as light excelleth darkness, and the wise man's eyes are in the head are in his head. But the fool walketh in darkness, and I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. Then said I in my heart, As it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me, and why was I then more wise? And I said in mine heart that this also is vanity, for there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man as the fool? Therefore I hated life, because the work that was wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored and wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Therefore, I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. And there is a, and there is a man whose labor is wisdom, is in wisdom and in knowledge and in equity. Yet to a man that hath not labor, therefore 
shall he leave it for his possession. This also is vanity and a great evil. For what hath a man of all his labor and of all the vexation of his heart wherein he hath labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrows and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This is also vanity. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good of his labor. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat, or else can hasten hereunto more than I? For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. May our Lord bless to our hearts, through our ears, the reading of his holy and infallible word on this Lord's Day morning. sounds pretty good without Mr. McCoy, don't you? But we won't tell him when he comes back. Missionary moment this morning, I received a phone call from Evelyn Ricker uh, last night, and she said that uh, Hal has the measles. Uh, he had been ill for a number of days, and they were very concerned. The doctor says, I want you to bring him in, do some blood work on him. It could be any number of tropical diseases there in Guatemala. And uh, he came out after checking the blood work, and he says he has measles. So at his age, I asked her, I said, did he ever have it before? And she says, at 90 years old, how, how do you remember back, you know, that far? And uh, I assume probably not. said he had gone to, I think it was Mexico, and was with a church gathering, and maybe some of the children had it and gave it unto him. So uh, we'll pray for his recovery. And again, it can be especially difficult for uh, someone uh, older and uh, some maybe some complications and uh, likewise for Evelyn also. So shall we look to the Lord as we continue in our worship in prayer. Father, the blessing is ours to be afforded a time in our week, uh, the beginning of the week, even as the women came to the tomb, found it empty and the angel sitting upon the rock and saying, even as the Lord had said, he was risen. And so from that moment, the history of the church has changed. And gathering together on the first day of the week has been the joy and privilege of your children to worship you, to begin a week with you, uh, to set our course 
upon the things that we glean here from your house, from the word of God, from the instruction of the spiritual things that are found therein, to join our hearts together in a time of, of uh, spiritual bonding as the body of Christ and to set the course for the week ahead that we're guided thereby. Thank you, Father, for each one who is here. And again, we're mindful of uh, young people who have gone back to college. And although they are apart from us, they are not apart from you. And whatever courses that they have laid uh, in studies and in life, we entrust their care into your hands, that their development, their growth, their progress, the relationships that they have, will be one that will be pleasing in your sight, that will continue to grow and to develop them into being the young men and young women that you would have them to be more like unto the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that as we have raised them and trained them, even in their early years, so we can entrust them to the care of others because your oversight is upon their hearts and lives. We thank you for such a confidence that we can have there. We also, Father, recognize that this is our Labor Day weekend in this country, a day upon which the country officially sets aside a recognition of the American worker. But we, Father, look into the scriptures and see the joy and privilege it is to labor with our hands, the gifts that you have given unto men and women to be good stewards of that which we have been given. Uh, this source of work and the Christian ethic of labor uh, is absent from our country and we pray father that it may never be absent from our own hearts we thank you that you give us the physical and the mental ability to labor and to to contribute to our society with particular skills but we recognize that these things all come from you uh, the, James tells us that a man uh, needs to work with his hands and if he's not working then he shouldn't be eating and we recognize that what a joy it is to serve in such a way. Uh, may we spend time over this weekend to thank you for the land that we have here, for the contributions that Americans have made uh, to the uh, society that we live in for good and to the world at large for the contributions that are ours. But we thank you especially for the contribution that is yours in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior who came to this earth and lived as man, labored with his hands, no doubt as a carpenter, and then his last three years laboring in the ministry, in the word and doctrine, and bringing forth his own self as a sacrifice to be a ransom for many. We thank you that the second Adam has trumped the first Adam, that we have victory in him, and that he is our hope, that one day we will see him as he is, and we will rejoice forevermore. Father, we thank you that we as a body of Christ have the responsibility to uphold each other in prayer as we conclude this service and go to our homes and head on into the new week. May your spirit make our hearts and minds to be members of those that need prayer. And when someone comes to us and asks for a prayer that we might not just pass it on with the word to say, oh yes, we'll pray for you, but that we will. That we'll uphold our brothers and sisters in Christ with the word of prayer. That we'll support them and strengthen them. That the things we've mentioned Sunday after Sunday about those who have particular physical needs or struggling economically or those who are traveling or whatever the issue may be, that, that we'll frequent our prayer closet and support them with a ministry of intercessory prayer. We think of our missionaries, and they so far, as far as distance is concerned, yet our hearts are right with them. And we pray for Hal Ricker, and pray your healing hand to be upon him. Pray that you, as the great physician, would heal him of this illness, and that you would protect Evelyn from any, any contact with this, if it's necessary. Uh, pray for the other family members also, uh, that if it's your will that they should get this in order to protect them later on, uh, so be it. Uh, we pray for their ministries and the two churches. We pray for the Los Angeles and the Montserrat Church. We pray for their outreaches, the teaching of English classes that has been uh, going on for many years. We pray for their outreaches with the Vacation Bible School, the distribution of, of New Testaments and scripture packs uh, for the outreach of the uh, 
the, the Bible store where other fine Christian literature is available in the Spanish language. Uh, many things have been uh, uh, gone on, Lord, and we rejoice in their 50 years of service to you in Guatemala. Uh, Lord, we also pray that you'll raise up others to uh, fill the gap in Guatemala and in other countries, that the service of the Lord Jesus Christ, whether it's through the independent board or through other mission agencies, might continue to go forth boldly. And yet, Father, we recognize that a majority of the people in this world live in a region where Christ's name is never mentioned, where they have no idea who Jesus Christ is, where the, the, there's no contact, no uh, institution whatsoever to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. To these unreached areas, O oh, Father, raise up young men and women to go forth to study their the languages and to understand the, the cultures and to be beacons of light in a very dark heathen area. O oh, Father, may these areas be reached in our generation. Thank you, Father, for the ministry of Pastor and Mrs. Spencer. Thank you for their privilege now to take their daughter down to Pensacola and as they would travel back, we pray for journeyings mercies for them. Uh, thank you, Father, that they feel uh, great confidence in, in doing this, as with all of their children, that they've entrusted uh, their care in your hands. And uh, we thank you for his ministry in the pulpit. Thank you for his ministry in the community, uh, outreach. And we pray that you'll undergird him and support him, as well as the session as we approach the 75th anniversary. We thank you, Lord, for our memories of the past. And they are based upon the faithfulness of our God. And so our current situation and our future is also based upon the faithfulness of our God. You, O oh Lord, are the one that we give praise and honor and glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's continue in our worship this morning as we offer our tithes and love offerings to our Lord and ask our ushers to come forward, please. Shall we pray? Father, thank you as the joy that we have to return a portion back of the blessings, of the tangible blessings that we've been given, uh, not only this week, but throughout our days. You're a faithful God. You've supplied us, and so out of a heart of love, we return a portion back to you. Bless gift and giver, for Jesus' sake. Amen.
Please be seated. And again, a hearty thank you for Evangeline's travel here. We might have been a little bit on the law side without our music, a song. And we are lost, aren't we? 342, Rock of Ages is our next hymn. It's good exercise. Let's stand, please. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded fight which flow be of sin a trouble cure save from wrath and make me pure could my tears forever flow could my zeal no longer know these for sin could not atone, thou must save, and thou alone. In my hand no price I bring, simply to I cross I cling. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes are in death when I rise to worlds unknown and behold thee on thy throne rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee now you may be seated I can say that with confidence. It's good to be here again this morning and thank the Lord for grace and mercy that has supplied each and every moment of our life. And um, yes, hip surgery was something that I needed probably a long time ago, but you know, you put it on the delay and finally forced to get it done. Uh, she said, you get it done or else. I didn't even know what the else or else was. But uh, I must admit that <clears throat> talked to another man who was just about the same age, and he had both hips done. He said, one I did, I was awake. They just gave me an uh, anesthetic for, you know, waist below. And I thought, huh, that'd be kind of neat. So as I'm making the preparations, they said, uh, well, you know, you can... Uh, uh, You'll talk to the anesthesiologist as they get you ready, and you tell them what, what kind. They'll explain everything again to you. And I said, okay. So as I'm getting ready, and they wheel me in on the gurney, I'm laying there, and I'm saying, whoa, that hip is pretty close. Now, we're just going to go under. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, was, that was it. But, you know, you wake up, and, and the pain of all of that was gone, and I just rejoice in it. So, Lord willing, next spring we'll get the other one taken care of. No marathons, mind you, but we'll be just happy to walk around regularly. Father, we thank you for this privilege to look in your word as we share we, what we believe is important. We ask that these seeds will fall upon good soil, a soil that will produce fruit, maybe of repentance, but fruit of joy, knowing that it brings us closer to you. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. A couple of Sundays ago, Millie and I went out to see the grandchildren and spent the Lord's Day with uh, our son and his church. And the pastor got up and explained that the week before, actually for a number of weeks, but this week before was their final week, they had moved from their old house into a new place, not too far from the other location. And he says it was a, a difficult week, final cleanup and everything and getting this stuff moved in. He says it was... It was a, a lot. But he says with a little smirk on his face, he said, one day I drove home from the church to my house and I drove up to the street and pulled in the driveway and I pulled my keys out and I 
went to the house door and I put it in. I thought, oh, wait a minute. This is my old house. <laughs> he never even thought about having moved. He went back to his old house. An old habit. You do something so many times, so often, and, and it becomes kind of like a rut. And it's difficult to make changes. It's difficult to make adjustments to something new. Sometimes that's not really too much of a problem. Those of you who may take a certain route to work or, or remember those days, and then all of a sudden the highway's closed and you've got to think, oh wow, I've taken this certain road all of these times and now I've got to think of another way to get from point A to point B, and it and causes a little bit of consternation. Sometimes it becomes something more difficult. Uh, my brother-in-law has been smoking probably for a good 20-some years. And his father died of, of lung cancer. And he understands the, the frailty of life, and he's struggling with it. But the rut that he's dug in right now, is it's a deep rut. And the, the, the path that he's on of doing the same thing and getting off of that to something else is hard for him. It's difficult. I think the worst habit, and the one that's hardest to break, is living our life as if there was no God. And I say that in all sincerity, because we gather here on this Lord's Day morning with a clear understanding of our relationship, an eternal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have that eternal life. But sometimes, we don't reflect it in the things that we do, in the way that we live. Let me ask you another question that I want you to seriously consider. Is there meaning to life if it all ends when I die? Is there meaning to life to the three score and ten years from my birth until my death? Is there meaning to life if all there is is in that period of time? We read Ecclesiastes and, and the author writes as if saying, I'm looking back and I'm saying, wow, I, I did all of this and I did all of this. And then in one moment he says, but I'm going to pass this on to the guy who comes after me. You know, I've labored and I've done it honestly and so forth, but he's going to do it and he hasn't labored at all. And wow, that's vanity. And he looks at another aspect and he says, that's vanity, it's emptiness. And he looks at another aspect and he says, wow, life is vanity. Is there meaning to life if all that there is in life is in that time between the time I'm born and the time I die? In the animal world, a mosquito lives for about two weeks. As far as I'm concerned, that's about two weeks too long. An elephant can live up around 60 or 70 years. And they say that there are certain species of whales that can live almost to 200 years. But in the animal world, they basically live to be born, they grow, they eat, they reproduce, and they die. It's a simple cycle, unlike human beings. We are different from the animal world. Unlike Dr. Doodlelittle's characters that talk back as if they have, you know, great brains, or, or the cartoon characters, the animals that go around and speak with human characteristics and interact as if they were human beings, the animal world has nothing like that. We human beings are different. We have a conscience. We make decisions of right or wrong. We have that ability to look at a situation and choose that adjusting it according to certain parameters. Unlike animals, we can appreciate. We have an admiration for beauty. We drive by the, uh, the flowers or a sunset. We see a painting and we look at it and we say, my, how marvelous that is. As if it's real, it's just so warm or it's so cold. And an animal, we could look at that and say, huh, now don't consider, I saw in the news the other day, some monkeys that were sitting there with a paintbrush going back and forth, and up and down, like they were creating something beautiful. Not quite what it meant. Human beings, we can wonder. We have a complex language. We have morality. We have imagination. And many other things that animals simply don't have. We are different from them. 
So for man, the question really is important. Is there meaning to life if it ends when we die? I'd ask you to turn your Bibles to Luke 12. I'm going to read from verses 16 through 21, a very familiar parable, Luke, Gospel of Luke chapter 12. parable that Jesus gave of a rich man. And as I read through this, you'll note as you look at it, the number of eyes, you know, this man speaking very boldly of himself. Verse, chapter 12, verse 16, And he spake a parable unto certain of them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he, this rich man, thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. It sounded very familiar to what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, didn't it? Very similar type of expressions. What happened to this man? He's living a life as if there was no God. He could not recognize that as a farmer, and I think especially for farmers, if anybody knows the the soil, the the rain, the sun, and the proper nutrients, and all of those things that go into it, he can't do a thing. Today we have all types of soil additives in order to grow certain things, but that always doesn't guarantee a good crop. Here's a man whose entire life, his entire source of all of the things that he's saying just the skills to do the planting, the skills to say, I know in my own mind that I need to build, build greater. What I have isn't sufficient. God's given him such an ability to even do the construction part of it. And yet no recognition whatsoever that God's hand was in his life and prospered him, profited him, gave him what was necessary to be as he was. He failed to recognize that God was in his life. He gave himself all of the credit, and he says his reward, take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, I've done it, this is my reward. The value of this man's life ended when he died. And for you see, his achievements, everything that he wanted in life, ended at that moment. That's what he wanted in life. To be the prosperous farmer, uh, construction man, whatever he wanted, that's what he drove for, he strove for. That was his whole intent. Not dating any of you, but in 1968 there was a popular song by Peggy Lee, Is That All There Is? And she talks really about her life going back to when she was a young girl and and there was problems with alcoholism and divorce and all these other things and it's a sad song she says is that all there is is that all there is to life is that all there is I ask you to turn to one other passage James chapter 4 James chapter 4 and I'll be reading verses 13 through 17 James 4, beginning at 13. Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even as, as a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live, 
or do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. What's behind the words there in verse 13? The idea of what the person is saying. Go into a certain city, you're going to do this, spend some time, make some money. That's a pretty simple course in business, isn't it? In economics. That's taught in the schools today, and it's, it's commonplace in the world. You go to a certain place, you stay a while, you establish a business, you do this, you make up some money, and then you move on to someplace else. We do it all the time. It's taught. That's part of life. And on the surface, we'd say that person who doesn't have anything like that, who doesn't make such plans, is lazy. Who sits back and says, well, the government will provide for me. Or I'm going to live off of this person or that person or live off of this or whatever. Aesop's fable, the, the, uh, was it the ant and the grasshopper? Remember that? The ant works and labors to prepare for all of the, the, the coming seasons and he works hard and the grasshopper just fiddles his life away. And when it comes time for the storms of winter, he's left with nothing. And so the world recognizes this very principle. But Jesus, through James here, takes it one additional step, doesn't he? He talks about the Lord's will. Jesus says, or James says, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't even understand the things of life and all that is laying before you. How many of you have plans for tomorrow? Memorial Day. Of course, some of you are a little shy, I'm not going to raise my hand. But I know you do. How many of you can guarantee what's going to happen tomorrow? This is ridiculous. None of us can guarantee even the next hour, much less another day or another week or another year or another ten years. And that's what James says here. You may can make plans, you can provide some goals and some guidelines, and that's good. But in life, ultimately, we have no guarantee, no assurance of anything beyond a certain moment that is in front of us. So if planning for tomorrow is no guarantee, what about the years ahead? Look at verse 15. What is your life? It's a mist, it's a vapor, and it's gone. And truly it is. I turn around and I look and I says, man, I've, I have one aunt who's 90, and the rest of all of those who were before me, they're gone. They've died. All of the older family members, and they've disappeared. And it seems like yesterday that they were right there. We uh, went up to my home church, church that came to know the Lord, and I looked at all the people, and they were old. They all got old, you know, like they're getting older. And I said, what about this one? That person died. This person died. It disappears. It's so fast. It's gone. You drive through the cities and the towns, and on the names of their buildings, there's names of so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. They used to own it. They built that building or whatever, and they put their name. And you ask people, who was that? I don't know. They're gone, disappeared. What is my life? And so the house that you built, the book that you may like to write, the computer program that you may have designed, in time it vanishes it away. July 1, 2, and 3, 1863, 150 years ago, not too far from here, in a large field named Gettysburg, there was a tremendous battle. 51,000 soldiers died on that field in three days. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine putting it into perspective of all of those soldiers who died, they were related to somebody else. They had dreams. They had aspirations. They had goals. They had plans. They had families. They had things they were going to do when the war is over. High hopes. But it ended in a moment. And they were gone. And so did everything. And with, Unless there was a, a, a biography or a certain monument because that particular soldier did something. Nobody knows a majority of those who are dead there in that field. 
They're gone, disappeared. And that's why James is saying, why you don't even know what tomorrow will happen. What is your life? It is a mist, a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. That's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? You know, when you think about that. Oh, we're going to remember this person. We're going to remember that, you know, when I'm gone, you better do this. And we say, yes, yes, we'll remember that. And then after about five years, they say, oh, I forgot all about it. I forgot all about that. You know. It's depressing, but we can say, well, Pastor Coleman, I'm a Christian, and I don't think of it that way. I, I accepted Christ as my Savior on a certain date in my life, and I believe that God set down in my life a plan for my life. He's a sovereign God. He ordains things. He providentially puts things in the path and opens doors and closes doors and directs doors. And I don't think about it as being depressing at all. I think that's very encouraging. I think it's something great. The truth of the matter is, as you read this passage here in James, some would say, well, I think he's talking to unbelievers because he's warning them, don't go into a city and do this and, and, and such and such and such and such. He's actually talking to believers. Why would he tell a Christian, be mindful of this? Why would he tell them and warn them of such a situation? James is warning Christians like you and me that even though we profess a relationship with the living God, we often act as if he is not there. As if we were the controlling factor in life. As if we were the ones who set up what happens tomorrow. We do that. We pass off so much of what God is privileged to give us and make so much of what it is on me. Verse 15, instead you ought to say, this is what you ought to be, if the Lord wills. You know, I talked before about ruts, about saying things or doing things that we just get into a patterning of doing it. And for Christians, it's kind of the same way. Uh, at the end of a prayer, we often say, in Jesus' name, amen. And we get do that habitually. And we say, well, why do you say that? Well, that's the way I was taught. <laughs> that's the way we always do it. That's the way the pastor, that's the way my mom and dad, or my Sunday school teacher, we always do that. And we get into the habit of saying that, but we fail to hold on to the beautiful principle that the access that we have to the, to the God of the universe is through Jesus Christ. And it's in his name, who he is. And, and therefore, we just kind of set it aside because we do it habitually. Another one is what James offers here. If it's God's will. I hear at times young people say with Christian background, well, I'm, what are you going to do for your life? Well, I'm going to finish school. I'm going to get married. I'm going to get a good job or some arrangement like that. You know, and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And then at the end they say, if God wills. <laughs> it's adding that on like saying in Jesus' name. And in case it doesn't turn out that way, well, then I come back and I say, well, it wasn't God's will. If it's God's will, then I did it. If, if it, you know, that was good. If not, well, that was God's will. You know, when we think of this relationship of what is being done and what's being accomplished, let me ask you, who prospers your life? Who prospers your life? God does, doesn't he? What percent? What percent of your life is prosperous by God? Is it 50-50? How about 75% God, 25% me? Oh, that's not very nice. How about 95%, 99% God, 1% me? What percent? It's all God, isn't it? Ultimately, it's his hand in my life who does those things. Who sees that your lungs breathe and your heart beats? Who opens and closes doors of opportunity? Who keeps and protects you in the night hours when you're fast asleep? Who provides for you 
every single material blessing of life? Who's control of all things? Who can frustrate your best plans? God. And we, we understand that and we say, yeah, I, I agree with that, you know. If God wills. With a resounding, unified voice, we say God does all of those things. And we recognize that. No, we don't always do, do we? We don't always recognize that it was God who prospered me and profited me, or who took this away, who opened or who closed that door, because of the way I act or react. And I say that because what happens when our plans fail? I become so disappointed. Isn't it? You take it up to the passage there in James, and he says, well, you go to the city, you do this and do this and do this, and, then, and that's the plans. But what if God says, I don't want you to go there, and I'm closing the door, and the plans fail? And what, what's my response? Well, thank the Lord that happened. No. Oh, man, what am I going to do? I'm so disappointed. I put so much into this. We feel like failures. We want to blame somebody. What did I do wrong? Why did this have to happen to me? Those are reactions when a door slams, when the, when the, when the, when the opportunity closes, when I lose, when something's there. And does he sit up in heaven and does he look down upon us and he say, Whoop, I missed up on that one. That's a good Christian down there. And I, huh, I really blew it there. I really should have allowed them to go to that city and make the profit and do that and that. Is that how God operates? And in the same sense, what happens when, when I do get the victory? When things go well? When I'm a winner? That's when I take the credit. Thinking of myself that I really know how to play the game of life. That I am very talented. That I have the degrees and I have the skills and I've worked hard for this and I deserve it. And again, I've taken the one who is, if God wills, and I've pushed him aside. And I've taken the credit where I've given him five and I've taken the ninety-five. In the span of life, from, from birth to death, life is worth living if I recognize that God is in it. And God is only in it if I recognize that he's in it. I mean, he's in it, but am I benefiting from it? Do I see it? Do I, do I give him the praise? Do I pause in life and say, Lord, you really did close that door? Talk to a young man with a family. And and company he works with, it's a small company. And he says, you know, we've got, you know, umpteen thousand dollars out in, in billings. And he says, I'm not going to go and write these people. And, and he says, you owe us, you owe us, you owe us. But he says, I'm faced with the fact that, that we have bills also to pay. But he says, you know what? God could have done this at any time. God could have sent in all of the money if it was his will, and I'm just going to trust him to meet the particular need at the particular time. It's not saying, oh, I've got to take it into my hands to start moving things around, to start shuffling. Move aside, God. You know, I've got to make some adjustments here. You're, at, you're asleep at the wheel. And we don't say that, but that's how we act. We're all, all worried how things are going to come about. Whatever your situation in life is today, whether you're piled high with trials of life or whether you feel that things are going smoothly, you need to live, read, eat, drink, sleep, breathe the fact that God is in it all. That his hand is in our life. He has not. We, we say... He's not forsaken us. He's not forgotten us. It, it, and I understand the reason for saying it. Sometimes we say, well, Lord, will you be with us here at our service? Brethren, where else is he going to be with his children? 
Lord, if you have time, can you please come in and join us? He's with us. And we need to respond and act and, and make my life, our lives, as if truly he is. And live life in such a fashion. We need to speak often with him in prayer. We need to ask his permission for plans and thank him for everything. And we need to let him speak to us through his word. It's become a dead book. Not just for the fact of reading through the Bible as a plan of life, but to say that this book has the answers. And he wants to talk to me through it. Solomon, the wisest man in the world. I say, next to Jesus Christ. You know. And what has Solomon done? That, that Ecclesiastes 2, he says, I did everything that every single man upon the face of the earth for all generations has ever wanted to do, and I succeeded. But then he says, whoa, my success means absolutely nothing because I'm going to die, just like the poor and the fool man, and all of the things that I've done with all of that will be for naught. And, you know, you read through that someday and you say, wow, where am I setting my plans and my goals and my situation? What about my family? What about some relatives? What about the guy next door to me? What about all of these other people? This word is him speaking to us. And I need to pour out my heart before him in prayer. We need to live as if, because it is, God is in charge and he is with us. He is moving through us every single moment of the day. It means we have to break out of some habits, some ruts, you know, the, 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 the muddy road. We're back and forth and all of a sudden the wheels fall into those same tracks and you can't get out. You're stuck in that rut. Well, we have to get out of some ruts. We've got to get out of the vehicle. We've got to dig them out. We've got to do whatever is necessary to get back on, on solid ground and make some changes to make some adjustments that I live for truly God is the Lord of my life. He controls things and I have to be responsible to him for that. Shall we pray? Well, Father in heaven, we wish to praise you for your clarity that has been spoken through the men and the women of the scriptures. Their lives are not different from ours. They live lives very similar Cultures were different, and clothing was different, and housing, and transportation, and foods, and such. But from the soul of the men, from Genesis to Revelation, they are the same. For the children, and the women, and the families, and the individuals, they're the same. And you dealt with them as you deal with us. Oh, Lord, make us learn from them that we fail not to give you the credit and the praise and the glory and to trust in you for all things that your will be done in our life on earth as it is in heaven. That we fall not back upon our own understanding but in all our ways acknowledge not just with our lips but with our very attitude, our very being that you are the Lord and that you live and rule in my life. And we'll praise you for that. Because one day in glory, that's exactly how it will be in perfection. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our service closes, and I'll ask you to take your hymnals, number 330.